Hello and welcome to episode 153 of the Comedy Slab. I'm Shane O'Connor. He's Adrian Lacey. If you only knew what I had to go through in order to get us to this point where we actually <laughs> sit down and record, it's like, you know, I just, because we do this thing, we, we, we record this over Skype in case you're, you're new to the podcast, because he's down there and I'm up here. And I looked at the picture tonight and he's even got a Victor Meldrew check shirt on. Just, just. <laughs> I don't believe. It. I, that's what I thought. I thought I don't believe it. Um, Yours is better. Okay, you win the Victor Meldrew competition. Oh, kicking and screaming! You have to drag him to the microphone. Anyway, we have. So let's make the most of it while we've got him here for the next hour. If you've never joined <laughs> this podcast before, then you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, it's all about comedy. Uh, that's generally what we talk about. That's why it's called the Comedy Slab. The idea is that we get the comedy, we whack it on the slab, we poke it, we prod it. That's we, not a euphemism. We, we, we <laughs> shove it about a bit. With it. I always like to think, my, my visual reference to all of this, I always like to think we're, um, and they, don't show, they haven't shown it on TV for ages. They used to show it on ITV3 all the while, but my visual reference would be Quincy. I, n I never watched either, so... Oh, you I used to do a joke about cyanide instead of ironside. Even then, I was hilarious. Yeah, even yeah. then. <laughs> but especially... Well, I found, I found it funny. But especially now. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're like, the, we're, like the, we're like the Quincy of comedy shows. Uh, we like to, uh, we like to uh, have a watch, have a listen, and then tell people what we think. I mean, you know, it's a bit like Owling at the Moon, isn't it, this podcasting business, really? Although... Oh. See, that's look at it. You can tell the difference. Uh, although, having said that, um, we do get figures, and it's nice to see. Nice to see so many people enjoying. So, thanks very much for that. If you could spread the word, we'd really appreciate it. Um, I pick a comedy one week. He picks one the following week. And uh, as we go through, we'll play you a couple of clips of the chosen comedy, and we'll give it a score at the end, uh, out of five each, giving it a total score out of ten. But before we do any of that. And before I tell you about this week's comedy that we're going to have a, a look at, comedy news. Yes. Or uh, when am I allowed to do a recommendation for you and our dear listeners? You got all teased didn't you? before we started, and you said, "Oh, I've got, oh, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a recommendation." And I went, "What is it?" And you went, "Well, I'd rather not tell you now if you don't mind." No, no, no. See, I'd spoil it. Can I do that quickly before we do comedy? Of course, you can. News? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I recommend, and I, I've stopped calling her your girlfriend, but Sarah. Kendall, who you will recall is an Aussie artiste, yes. writer, stand-up, I think a comedy actress, comic actress. I'm not quite sure how she brands herself. Anyway, a talent, certainly. Because you got all Newman and Badil on me, didn't you? Because I said, I said I quite liked what she did. And then you, for the next 15 years, went, <laughs> that's your girlfriend, that is. You love her, you do. <laughs> well, anyway, I think you're going to enjoy this um, show because uh, each week she talks to a different a comedy artist. And only tonight, as I speak as we're recording, slightly earlier in the week than we normally do, um, she was talking to Sharon Horgan. All right, yeah. And they're talking, uh, well, the show is called Talking Stories. So they talk about how they write stories, how they produce material, um, performing, all of that, uh, first night nerves or whatever it is. And there are some inter interesting nuggets there. Sometimes, uh, like tonight, tonight, I was looking for more examples of the kind of thing they were talking about. So it's slightly, I would have to say, underproduced in that sense. Sometimes you know, uh, I find myself saying, well, you know, give us an example of when this happened that mm. you're talking about theoretically. Yeah. Um, but, but generally, it's a good listen. Um, last week, I think it was Chris Addison, who's made the trans, I nearly said, said transgression, um, me and my mouth, transition from, um, from actor, comedy actor, performer. He's also a stand-up, but he's a director these days, which I didn't, I didn't know. Um, but uh, doubtless, he's on the small print of one or two things you and I might be uh, enjoying and people mm. listening as well. So it's, it's a bit of a look under the bonnet of how uh, comedy is produced and a little insight into that and you know, a little bit of a giggle as well. Oh, okay. It's interesting. I, I, there was a series, and I can't remember what it was called. It was probably as basic as comedians interviewing comedians. Do you remember where they used to pass the baton on? So, Oh, was that called The Chain? Well, it could have been, we, yeah. It was a radio Last thing, week's interviewee it? was next week's interview. Exactly, yeah. Versa. Yeah. I kind of thought, oh, I'd really like that. But it, again, it's the this is where football falls down for me. It's this assumption that because people have played football, they will make great pundits. 
or, mm. or great co-commentators. And, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and I was really disappointed with it because, um, basically, because they weren't interviewers. You know, they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't think like that. And as you yeah. say, it kind of really frustrates you. So it'd be interesting to have a listen to to see whether she pulls it off or not. Because, uh, like I say, just just because you you know comedy, um, mm. does, and you do comedy, doesn't necessarily mean that you you're a great interviewer, does it? I guess. No, and they being fellow performers, they will tend to be a little bit possibly over generous to each other like everything is wonderful this director is wonderful that performance is wonderful and i like working with him because he's wonderful yeah and you know a journalist would say well what do you mean by that and well this happened and i saw this in the news is that true you know the awkward questions i'm I mean, journalists are the awkward squad it's well I mean, it, it's and it's right and this is again it's with football with sport this is why you know sports journalists um, never ask any difficult questions of of players because if they do, they won't get invited back next week. They won't get a pass and they won't get in. But it's for, it's mm. you said you mentioned Chris Addison there, and the hackles stood up on the back of my neck because he's <laughs> he's one of those people who, whilst I like to watch him and I like his work and things he's, things he's been in, he's mm. one of those people that I feel like I know too much about his views, if you know what I mean. Right, and and that is it. Like, more that you don't agree with them, what his views. Mm. Yeah, I, d I don't agree with the vast majority of the ones that he espouses. Are we, are we talking politically? Yeah, his political mm. views, and 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 you know, it, it it ruins it a bit, really, for me that kind of thing because it's kind of that that sort of. I don't mind that he has those views. I just feel that I know too much about them. Does that make sense? Uh, it kind of does, but um, it's uh, it's a rare bird that turns down too many chances to promote themselves in the world of acting and performing. That, yeah, I see I, that. Mean, well, I think we might come on to that in the comedy news, mightn't we? Yeah, enough. yeah I, I was just going to say, I, I think that's, that is a way of promoting yourself. I think it's it's the reverse. I, well, I, I just wanted to mention, I was just looking, we were looking around for some comedy news, and we, as one of the ports of call we go to is uh, the wonderful comedy.co.uk website. And uh, they've got <laughs> no, no fewer than um, three stories all around uh, Ramesh Ranganathan who and that's that's all on the front page isn't it which is it's all within about well it depends how big your screen is but all <laughs> within about six <laughs> centimeters of each other aren't they really if you <laughs> well my screen's bigger than yours so I don't want to brag um yeah he's going to host um or he's going to become the new host of a league of their own um can he's... you explain that for the non-sportive types like what I am it's well, it's, isn't it? it's just another panel show isn't it but is it like Sue Barker and Question of Sport? It's, well, it's a bit like they think it's all over. I think really, but but a lot, a lot, a lot more dumbed down from what I've seen of it. It's you know, um, James Corden used to be on it, didn't he? And um, you're, you're saying it like I've watched it with James Corden. In. Oh, it was no, awful. I haven't. Awful, but... in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Um, he's doing another one of these sort of documentary things that he does, the misinvestigations of Ramesh Ranganathan coming to BBC Two, and he's also. <laughs> He's also presenting his own hip hop show on Radio Two, um, which I, we slabbed him in something, didn't he? The the, uh, well, the pub thing, yeah. Where's the landlord? Yeah, mm. um, which I quite like. So I quite like. I do like him as an actor. I'd like to see more of him as an actor, of less of him of of in all the other things put together. And I find I just wondered that that kind of knowing too much of people's views and overexposure. Mm. I wonder whether it is actually turning people off, artists in that way. I've, I've, but uh, people who, when the phone goes in an insecure world, particularly affected, uh, or the, well, the acting world, certainly the stage world's obviously been affected by COVID. I mean, it doesn't, in, in quotes, excuse everything. And you're just putting the, the well, a hideous year a lot of people have had to one side, if you can. Mm. But, um, would you really, if the if the phone went now and you were given an offer of a high profile TV show or radio show, say no, I'm overexposed. I mean, I think, but isn't but that, but a TV show or radio show, you kind of think well, you'd forgive anybody for taking that, wouldn't you? Really, mm. but well, there's three in one breath. I mean, there's there's a lot of people like that, aren't there? You kind of think, um, isn't isn't there a isn't you know is there anybody else out there that can that could, you know, like Catherine Ryan is another one who's ubiquitous. Um, it's not nice to the rest of the industry in a way that they keep doing it, is it? Because people go, oh, well, I, I can't get any work now because he's got everything. So it makes it even worse, really. Except so, you could never realistically say, 
he or she who's got my job, because that's just like saying my life could have been totally different if only this happened 20 years ago. Well, if, or well, he's I'd met someone else. He's got at least two other people's jobs there, isn't he? If you say he does one job and there are three jobs that he's doing, he's, he's got at least two other people's jobs there. But yeah, but showbiz isn't about sort of showing up at the office nine to five, 40 hours a week. No, but as you said, if you offered anybody a show, they'd rip you. So there are, two, there are three A shows <laughs> and he's doing all three of them. And that doesn't count then, the ones but, that he's doing as well. And that doesn't count the victory VZ sucks in between. I've got some sympathy for any performer who says, well, when there's work, you say yes. Is I it mean, the I'm... fault of the, the, the producers then? Is it the fault of the people producing this? Because the League of Their Own is Sky. The, thing, the other thing is for BBC Two and the other thing is for Radio Two. So is it is it incumbent upon the people who are hiring him to say, what else are you doing at the moment, Ramesh? Are you doing something for Sky? Oh, well, we'll leave it until you finish doing that now for a while, thanks. But they don't, no, no, if, if they've got him, we want him as well. And then and then Radio 2 go, oh, are you, are you slightly famous? Oh, well, we'll have you. You, you can have a radio show because that's how they work. Do you know what I mean? And, and then Except, except again, the time lag thing. I mean, knowing myself, because I have been a researcher writer on a BBC Radio 2 documentary, and I put the original idea into a producer two years yeah. before we then got the go-ahead. Right. Um, and then, uh, I think I've said before on the, on the podcast, we were trying to get the wonderful um, uh, Tom Petty. Um, uh, obviously, this is a few years ago now. Sadly, he's no longer with us. Uh, that would have been a massive steal, except as I... Uh, uh, forgive me if you've heard this story before, but um, he was having his teeth done and uh, couldn't take on any more voiceover work. So, look, even rock superstars have to have their visits to the dentist. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's all this that we, we're not aware of the backstory, are we? And there could be a two-year time lag. Although, again, I would suggest there isn't because the BBC thing, the misinvestigations of Roma Shrang and Nathan, comes off the back of one of the other ones he's just done, which is only a year old. So that's that's only at least a year old, isn't it, really, in that in that sense? Um, mm. The Radio 2 thing, well, that that's an instant hire, isn't it? They've just got to say, who are we going to get rid of and who are we going to stick in, in your place? That's That doesn't take any time at all. And the league of their own, um, he's actually, he's just sitting in the chair. He's, he's replacing somebody else, whoever's doing it now. I forget who's doing it now. That's how memorable it is. Is it Danny Dyer? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, shall we move on to the uh, the slab of the comedy, uh, mm. the meat and, meat and potatoes, as it were? I chose uh, a spin-off last week, a spin-off from um, the wonderful series Porridge. We've, we have we we slab Porridge, didn't we? I think it was a, wasn't it a Christmas special, which was not last Christmas. I'm suspecting at least two Christmases ago. Uh, could well be, could well be. But yeah, I, I, I thought that was really well written. Oh, just, it's a bit of class in it, really. Uh, we'll come on to Dick Clemens and Ian Lafrenet, eh? um, I'm sure, as we go through. Um, but yeah, so I chose the spin off to that, which only lasted a series, interestingly enough. It was, it's called Going Straight. It's all about Fletcher, uh, Norman Stanley, doing exactly that. He's been paroled. Um, and he's out on the outside. He's living with his daughter Ingrid uh, and uh, who, her boyfriend, who actually is uh, Lenny Godber, Fletcher's old cellmate. Hmm. Um, and uh, so it's a kind of it's a it's a family sitcom, isn't it? In a way, I suppose. It, it, do you think yeah. it's a, a traditional sitcom style? Traditional, good word. Traditional, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so before before we get into the uh, the bones of it, I. I Telling you last week that we were going to do this. What were your thoughts? Had you seen it? Have you, are you familiar with this or not? No, I don't think I had. I'll tell you what I was confusing it with. There was at least one episode when he goes home for the weekend. Yes. And that, that leather jacket we see him wearing going straight is, is the kind of cue that, all oh, right, he's off duty, as it were. He's out, out of chokey. Um, so, yeah, my view was... Uh, 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 hoping for as good a quality as uh, we'd seen in that uh, Christmas episode. Okay. Um, I, I have to say, and I came from the other side of this, um, knowing it so well, I could even sing, <laughs> sing along with the theme tune, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, which I didn't... Oh, going straight. Oh, yeah, straight, yeah, Zanara, which I didn't realise until it, it, we, I started looking at it, and I thought, wow, I know all the words to the theme tune. That is infinitely sad. And there are other references as well, which I'll come back to, um, which were kind of um, got into the DNA of our family at the time, interestingly enough, but uh, but there you are. Mm -hmm. So shall we, before we, um, we get a headline off you in a way of... Uh, 
summarising what you thought of it. Shall we? Shall we bang a clip in and uh, let everybody have a listen to um, to going straight? So Fletcher has uh, a job on the outside. He's uh, he's a night porter for a hotel uh, in Paddington. Interestingly enough, I was having a look at some of the uh, the streets around there. I think it was Paddington. Would you say it was? Um, well, Sussex Gardens is mentioned. Uh, I was trying to surreptitiously look it up. Well, I looked it up on a map and he said, I'd never heard of this before. Tybernia. Have you ever heard of Tybernia? Uh, is that a small nation state in the Caribbean? I think it is, yeah. It's, it said it was like either Paddington, Tybernia or Hyde Park Estate is, uh, is roughly where he, where he was in the hotel anyway. Anyway, it matters not. So this hotel in Paddington. Uh, and we catch up with him as he turns up for his night shift. Hey, Mr McEwen. Joe Fletcher! <laughs> Come through, would you? Yeah. We're in Lurley. Yes, well, my son Raymond had a few friends around, you know. Sort of party like. Oh, that's nice. Well, not really. Six form punk society, it was. <laughs> I thought, being as how I was on parole, it wasn't the sort of company I should mix with. <laughs> I'm not one to complain. Means I can hand over the reins that much earlier, etc., etc. Might pop round to the anchor for a quick one. Oh, I wouldn't advise that. Not tonight, son. Oh, why? Well, there's a load of Scotsmen in there tonight. They're down for some union confab or something. Are they causing trouble? No, 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 no. No, they're, uh, they're very merry, as a matter of fact, at the moment. But you know your Scotsman. He can turn ugly in the twinkling of a sporran, can't he? <laughs> and it's at times like that they are seized with an insatiable desire to pummel someone's head. I'm Scots, Fletcher. Oh, dear, right? Oh. <laughs> at least my forebears were. Oh, you had four, did you? One more than Goldilocks. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Goldilocks. She had three bears, you had four bears, yeah? It's a joke. Never mind, never mind. Oh, yes, I see. <laughs> well, Fletcher, tonight marks your first week here. Yes, sir. I'd like to tell you I'm well pleased, and I'd like to give you this. Oh, that's very nice. Sir. What's that? A pay packet. Oh. Have you never seen one before? No, my money usually goes straight into a bank, sir. Or straight out of it, you know what I mean? Well... Uh, I can confirm Sussex Gardens is indeed in uh, Paddington, near Hyde Park, London West too. So um, we've both got an element of rightness. I'm not sure this kind of hotel would exist anymore in that area. Um, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I, well, I looked, I looked it up on Street View, sadly enough, again. <laughs> oh, silly me, thinking that you wouldn't be that thorough. And where he comes out of looks like it's now a private residence a very well-to-do private residence, and it looks like it wasn't so well-to-do when he stepped out of it as a as a hotel. I mean, you, it's 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 a frontage, isn't it? So you kind of think it's probably yes. more than a hotel. Well, I mean, that was probably before the Russian oligarchs moved into London and pushed up the prices. Um, you'll be wanting a little headline. Yeah. Uh, can and I just say, can I just say that four bears joke made me, made me laugh out loud. It made me laugh out loud again then. I, I don't know what it is about the, the wisecracking that they write for... For Fletcher. But then the joke is that the hotelier, as we discover, it's a running gag, that he doesn't get gags or he's slow. He gets them eventually. Yeah. He also says, etc., etc., which is a bit tedious, but it's a character trait. So ho hum. Right. He says, etc., etc., etc. Right. <laughs> I, I've got. Did you have two headlines last week? We normally have uh, one headline we prepare each we week. We had about eight, didn't we? It was. It was just. It well, just, I've got, it just, I've we got were three. Mock with it. it was. Uh, it was a mock. It was a mockery of headlines. Um, which, like, which do you want? One, two, or three? Oh, just pick, pick one. Don't be ridiculous. We'll just get, just get out of hand. You're having all those. three eventually. It's just the order you get them in. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> Go so with I, it. So it was me thinking I had a choice. Okay, I've got going a bit too straight. Yeah. Meaning I wasn't laughing enough. Or it was like swimming through porridge. Oh, that's a good one. That's clever, that is. Or the hotel setting is faulty. Oh, that's Ooh, yeah. see what I did there. Yeah, yeah, I like all of those. And They're all different in their own their own little way, aren't they? They are, but they all tell a story of me being underwhelmed. I'm afraid. Mm, do you? Oh yeah, dear. Oh dear. Come on, show you working out then. Okay, here we go. I had a bit of a rev revelation this afternoon. Maybe it was the tea, but you know this old cliche. But maybe it's a, one of those cliches that is a cliche for a reason, which itself is another cliche that comedy or sitcoms are very often the comedy of confinement mm. people in an unhappy marriage stuck in a relationship or stuck in a a hotel uh not this one so much as thinking 40 towers and you know um that's certainly an unhappy marriage isn't it a mr and mrs Fulty. um 
and so on and so forth. Well, I mean, w there's no greater, in quotes, confinement, comedically, artistically, than to be in, in prison, is there? I mean, there was no way for him to go except very occasionally, as we just made reference to, uh, you know, you get the occasional compassionate leave. Mm. Um, you take him out of that situation, you've immediately, I think you've removed a layer and possibly, arguably, a layer of comedy. So he's a bit more naked, actually. You can shake your head on Skype. He's shaking his head on Skype, too, isn't he? <laughs> That's my working. You asked for my working. I, you can't I, I, shake your head I, at my working. I just don't know how you can... You I'm shake her. I mean, it's so obvious that he is completely confined by society, isn't he? He's confined by the constraints of... Um, a normal work in life being a if normal working man. If I said that, man. you'd call me a Marxist and a lily-livered flipping Guardian reader. Well, no. I, I, Guilty as charged. It, it is. I mean, that, you can see... I'm not that, a Marxist, you, but the Guardian <laughs> You can see, you know, this whole idea that, like, you know, him getting a... He, he, he gets a wage packet and then, and then through the programme he ends up with 5p out of his wage packet because it's all it's all gone and everybody else has laid a claim to it whereas if he was you know with a dishonest life um he he'd have been much happier or he certainly feels that he'd have been much happier I, I but then but then he's confined himself if you're going down that route he said i'm going to go straight yeah, oh, yeah as in the title yeah clue is in the title yeah yeah but, but well that's not strong is it because the confinement in prison was someone else imposing it on him Admittedly, as a result of his felonies, but um, well, I think this is... I think it's even stronger because I mean, then essentially, what you're saying is that his confinement is within himself, is within his own mind. God, this is almost like Tolstoy. God. It's but, well, I was going to say Kafkaesque. Yeah, it's it, like, it, do you know what I mean? He's, he's. I mean, if you wanted to take it that deeply, I mean, I think, I think the the clever thing about this is that you. As you rightly say, you know, you have this ultimate confinement. So they've kind of said, well, let's release him and see, see, if, you know, release the bird and see if he flies. But isn't there a reason it um, didn't get a second series? Or is that more to do with the tragic, untimely death of um, Beckinsale? I think, it, I think it was. I think it was like scheduling. And then I think Richard Beckinsale died at, at a ridiculously young age, didn't they? Um, I had 30 around then. Yeah. yeah. And... and I mean, it ha it has a strength in itself. I mean, I would agree with you that the supporting cast in Porridge. I mean, you you know, with people like Tony Sober and and um... <coughs> aren't you missing someone? What? Don't pretend you don't. <laughs> What's my surname? I, I only said one, didn't I? I said, yeah, but you were I'm, taking your time. I'm, it should have been top of the list. I was going to say Tony Sober and Biggins and uh, Fulton McCry and um, uh, what was Mr. Barraclough? I can remember everybody's name. No, but, Norman someone or is he Norman Barraclough? Oh, what's he? confused. And, of course, the, <laughs> the very incomparable famous. Ronald Lacey. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Well, maybe that was top billing because you waited till last. But it was, wasn't it? I mean, the, the supporting cast were just stellar, weren't they, in Porridge? Yes. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying actually that, uh, that I, is the only reason it's a bit weak. I think, I mean, why would you want to touch a hotel situation so hard on the heels relatively of Faulty Towers? Though? Mm. It does look a bit lacking in imagination. Again, it could be our old friend... Um, mistiming or unfortunate timing or time lags that we don't know about, that this was written 10 years before, for all we know, mm. and Forty Towers uh, came along later and then blah, blah, blah. But uh, I don't know, it's just not, not working for me. It's very dependent on coincidences, and I have to say, the more they rack up coincidences, the more I think, right, something's not quite right in this universe. Yeah. We're not, there's no explanation as to why uh, uh, Lenny Godbert has come out at the same time, apparently, come out not in the, come out in the prison sense, uh, at the same time. That's quite handy, that, isn't it? Because well, they were cellmates. They were doing a different, a different stretch, weren't they? I think, I think. Well, that's fine. And one might have started after the other. You're allowed. Well, they did. Fletcher, Fletcher was in well before Godbert was in. Okay, look, that's one coincidence. But then we get a coincidence 
a couple of policemen, including the wonderful um, Pete Possel, oh, no. with um, with the uh, with the cheekbones to, that you could uh, shave Parmesan on. To coin a phrase, mm. thank you, Richard. Um, the, you know, they're talking to. Um, uh, uh, Fletcher and well I'm not going to spoil it but anyway there's another coincidence there in the background as they're talking um, another coincidence that um, oh dear me Fletcher's daughter is dating Godbert well that was Again, set up he, that was set up in porridge as well well to make it right it's no, no I know it's handy. not a coincidence is it they're, they're actually taking <laughs> because it because it's a coincidence no they're taking it from porridge it's written because it's not it was, it, but it's not a co- it's not you're, like, you're not coming to this fresh and going Oh, going straight. Oh, he's he's actually hooked up with her now. They actually set that one. That was a storyline in Porridge. Yeah, well, they probably saw it coming, didn't they? They, they yeah. were just lining everything up. Yeah, you stand up and knock him down. Go on, give us another coincidence. <laughs> um, hang on. Uh, be coincidental if I could find one. <laughs> um, no, I can't let you away with that one. I mean, that that is a. I, I think that's a great bit of writing because. Unless they've got one eye on. Oh, oh coincidence! Well, a big plot point. Uh, again, I don't want to spoil everything, but uh, the the that um, Fletcher happens to be across this scam. Quotes. Well, he knew the guy, I'm, didn't he? Because he sp- he'd spent time in prison with him. I mean, I, I in see, Maidstone. In the, coincidence, in, but hey, they're in the prison system in seventies London. Uh, yeah, in the prison system, and in seventies London. I mean, it's like he made reference to it. He said, "Which which fence did you go to?" I went round all of the ones that I knew. And and you know the, you can't that that is something that in the seventies like if you watch um, uh, the Sweeney, you know mm. they, they can't it it does feel like a, a closed in close knit world where a lot of people know a lot of other people sort of thing. So I I didn't there is a, there is a bit of that. I'm not banning all coincidences because otherwise I wouldn't have a book that I'm trying to write. I think I think it's really it's really harsh. I do. I I think. Uh, I'm, I'm harsh really, but fair. I'm really surprised. But no, I just think it's harsh. <laughs> or harsh but harsh. Yeah, I, I, did, ooh, I did. It's really interesting, isn't it? How you, you. I mean, because you really like porridge, didn't you? You, you were, you, you and I. Yeah, were but I, I, I mean, I don't think I like it overall in the same way you do. And um, regular listeners will know. Forgive me. This is a bit of a retread that I am a Unitarian. So one episode of a, of a show will usually do me these <laughs> Which days. Which is why Life everything is short. looks like a coincidence to you. <laughs> Yeah, but that gives me a, a godlike oversight, obviously. <laughs> As everyone why. chokes on their porridge. Oh. Uh, okay, look, I did give I invited you to make the case for. And also I'd be interested to know how do you measure it against porridge? Oh, I I think I think it's you couldn't it doesn't stand up wholly against porridge. I think porridge towers above. And and I think Particularly for the for the reason that I mentioned earlier, that the supporting cast. I mean, when you look at the people um, who Brian Wilde was Mr. Paragluff, by the way. When you when you look at the you. when you look at the people who were involved in that, I, I mean, it was inspired, wasn't it? Not only the writing, but mm. the, the casting of that. And I think it stands head and shoulders above Going Straight. I mean, it's it's a, it's a spin off, and I mean. Is it worth mentioning where where you stand on spin-offs? I mean, do you do you instantly take against them and think, oh, what are they doing that for? That's that's you know. I have to say, if I'm brutally honest, I think they. Well, they certainly. I don't think this is unreasonable. I think they have to prove themselves in their own terms. It's not enough that I accept. Oh, it's come off a great show. I've got to love it or I'm going to love it. It must be good. And I'm not allowed to say anything against it yeah. because it's come from this mighty juggernaut of a show. I mean, that's reasonable, isn't it? You judge every show on its merits. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the the one thing that, that I always think is that it depends on who's written it. And very often a spin-off will be written by somebody else. So it's almost like it's not, it's not you know, taking on the work of the... Whereas with this... It was a Clement and Lafrenet work uh, of uh, uh, from Porridge and also from this as well. So that it was kind of it came from their pen, as it were, and uh, yeah. that makes it, to my mind, whether I'm right or not, in, in my own mind, it kind of makes it more legitimate in a way. I'm kind of with you, but it, uh, um, yeah, I, I think equally, just to put the other case, it's equally it would be wrong of me to say because it's a spin-off, I don't like it. That's prejudicial from the other direction. Yeah. So um, yeah, fine. But um, we should get to our second clip 
soon. Is this an appropriate moment? Do you think? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Yeah, more than happy. Um, can I just mention before we do? Um, yes. The seventeen-year-old Nicholas Lindhurst. Actually, I have to say, of all the lines, and there were some good gags in there. There's one that made me chuckle. That um, <laughs> it was actually he fed the line. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Have you seen my headphones? Yeah. Yeah. Is that, and that's in this clip, isn't it? Uh, so I won't ruin the punchline. Yeah, I think I think so, yeah. I think, I think <laughs> If it isn't, we'll try and fill in the gap. And by the way, this, uh, before we move on too swiftly, is a BBC production. It was so much simpler in those days, you didn't have to mention independent production companies. So a BBC production, copyright, as I said earlier, 1978. Although, of course, the finances were far less lucrative, which is why they changed it. Um <laughs> Yeah, no. Well, yeah, fair dues. That was one of the things that got into the DNA of our families. Like whenever I used to say to my dad, "I say, have you have you seen have you seen my Pink Floyd cassette? And he, <laughs> and he, and he, have you seen my headphones? It did like the kind of, like like Raymond was, you know, and that was how I kind of knew all that. Um, yeah, in, there was a little swipe at punk music as well while, while um, yeah. Fletcher was at it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, go on. Let's have a listen to the clip then. Uh, we're we're back in the Fletcher household. We know Fletch um, has uh, reached this uh, incredible life milestone. He's he's in the kitchen with uh, his daughter Ingrid and uh, and Lenny Godper as well. Oh, that is your first ever pay packet. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Congratulations, Fletch. Yeah, well. Yeah. Can I have that six quid you owe me, then? <laughs> what six quid? From the pub last week. Oh, that's six quid. All right, anyway. Yeah, give me that. What are you doing? Well, you owe me a fiver from the previous week. And I, the insurance man, I can pay him now, because we're a month behind. What insurance? What? Your life insurance, Dad. Costs a bit, but it's worth it, because if anything happened to you, we'd be quidzing. <laughs> Here's your six, Len. Listen, why doesn't he pay board and lodging? He gets an allowance, you know, they all do. Well, he gives me that allowance, Dave. Oh, well, let's have it, let's share it out, then. No, no, Ingrid puts that into our fund. In, uh, into, into our fund, like. What fund? Uh, must be off. <laughs> What's he talking about? What time is it? Uh, time I was off. <laughs> Don't do that to me. <laughs> Morning, son. See, my is fine. Why, what do you want to do? Listen to your Rice Krispies? <laughs> Look what your dad's brought home, Raymond. Oh, good, cos you owe me money. What for? <laughs> you broke the stylus on my stereo, said you'd replace it. It cost three fifty. Oh, do you like vultures? A lot of you, ain't you? Give me that packet here. What you left me with? Look at that. <laughs> Oh, good, we need that for the gas meter. <laughs> I've got to have a word. I don't want to sound like the mean-spirited person I really am mm. underneath my podcast persona, but accents, come on. I think the standards were a little bit lower in the 70s. I'll die it. That's like me saying, I'm a brummie. Well, Isn't that? yeah, it's interesting you say that because um, I don't know if you ever caught up with uh, the Glums. Oh, yes. I, I know what you're talking about. I think a similar accent there. Where um, the TV series, which was a year after this, mm -hmm. um, Patricia Brake, who plays uh, Ingrid, uh, reprised the role of Eth, which is Jimmy Edwards' daughter-in-law. Uh, he was going out with his son, Ron. Do you remember that? And Ron, Ron was played by Ian Lavender, believe it, not talking about Brummies. Um, right. And she used to go, oh, Ron! Oh, no, no, and in exactly the same I way. I didn't think she'd be old enough to have been in the, the Glums, because that was 50s, wasn't it? Well, yeah, but she was she was reprising the role that was originally done on the radio series by June um, Whitfield. Right. Gotcha. Who, who started that, oh, Ron! Why do you have to be like that? And did that kind of accent. So mm. I, I, it's interesting that it's this is seventy eight, and she's doing she's talking like that. Although she had done it through porridge as well, hadn't she? She that mm. was. A, but well, accents have definitely shifted, and and yeah, you know, there's been a definite shift in that time in the London accent. What we think of as a, a maybe a working class London accent, mm. although that's even that's too broad a term. But then we have Nigel Hawthorne, lovely to see him, but a very unconvincing working class accent from what, I mean, I, I don't know his background, but uh, 
you know, even if he'd come from a humble background, very often you lose that because you have to going through drama school, darling, yeah, yeah. receive pronunciation and RP and BBC accent and all of that. Um, so I, I thought I thought that was that was one less positive way that you could tell uh, that, it, that it was a little bit old. Yeah, of its time. I, I felt the same with Nigel Hawthorne. You, you do, and I don't know whether that's because. Um, in subsequent stuff, he's he's been terminally posh, um, yeah, and you kind of yes you, minister. Yeah, you're used to that, and you kind. But it did kind of sort of flow in and out a bit, didn't it? Really, but but you know. Mm. But also, the hotelier was, I don't know. Maybe there were loads of posh underachievers in the seventies, but it reminded me of another the show we'd done where the secretary was posher than you. The, the, I can't remember what the show was, but from that sort of era. The men from the ministry, wasn't it? I th- absolutely, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which, again, same kind of stable, isn't it? It's it's interesting, this to me as well, is, th- is that this is the natural progression from those kind of 70s shows. Uh, because, of course, the writers from this had been, in the 70s, had been writing um, Whatever Happened to the Likely Lads, uh, and before that, The Likely Lads. Um so they'd, they'd kind of written those, quite a few series of that in the 1970s, but must have had their eye on all the other things like the men from the ministry on radio and listening to all the other bits and pieces. So I just wonder whether this is kind of the natural progression to the late 70s as you start to get into the early 80s then. It's quite an interesting milestone in history. I mean, the two guys in question, I don't know whether you know much about them. I've recently, I've just not so long ago, finished reading their... Um, their autobiography with wrote a joint autobiography which oh i remember you saying yeah yeah i'm not sure great if that's, idea yeah but i suppose a natural a natural progression for them i mean which i would thoroughly thoroughly recommend and the interesting thing is i mean i, I had it on audiobook so i was listening to it while i was doing the garden and stuff like that um but it was fascinating but the interesting thing f- from that the, from that point of view is that they wrote a chapter each but but they wrote about each other in the chapter so it wasn't just oh and i did this and i did that and then the next one comes along and he goes and i did this and i did that so it was like kind of into work it's, it's beautifully written piece of work it's called more than likely if you get the chance to read it or listen to it on audiobook um i would thoroughly recommend it because and and what a couple of really entertaining and talented and clever chaps they are in actual fact we're talking about the theme tune to this Mm. Um, and I don't know if you realise, did you, did, you know the theme sheet that it was actually written by Dick Clements and Tony McCauley? No, I was going to ask about that because I wondered if it was a, a Ronnie Hazelhurst type figure who did a lot of work on 70 sitcoms. Dick Clement wrote the words and uh, Tony McCauley, who you probably think, well, because I didn't, I had to look up and see what he, what he, what he did. Um, mm. But he, he's the guy who wrote uh, Baby Now That I Found You, uh, Build Me Up Buttercup, and Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes. Oh, yeah, all of the same stable. And Don't Give Up On Us, the uh, David Soul one, Don't Give Up On Us, baby. Mm. So Credited with saving many a relationship. I, I Look, there, there's lots to like in it. I, d- I haven't said that in so many words, but people listening more closely than perhaps you, darling, will have uh, heard me say early on, there, there's some nice gags. Um it's very much of its time, and we can't expect them to suddenly leap into the 21st century in in production terms or this, that, and the other mm. way. So, yeah. Uh, who's Holt? Who goes there first? I'm sorry, story? I wasn't listening to you then. Um, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> <laughs> no change there. This is this is the longest running dysfunctional marriage I think I've been in. Oh, go on then. Um, I don't mind. Do you want to go first? Okay. Uh, I'd say I'm going to give it a three out of five. But the the hint there that it's not all I would have liked is that regular listeners will know my default's three and a half. If I really like it, then we're getting into the four, four and a half territory. Very rare to to, to, to go, as it were, the whole hog. Um, so, yeah, the three out of five is meant to say just that, that, that there is lots to like. Um, people got to make their own minds up as ever. You know, we're, we're not experts telling from on high, like... Um, uh, Ronnie Barker's judge uh, with the gavel, you know, looking down on uh, everyone in court. You know, this is what you must like. Um, but I wonder what that makes of your scoring because it might not be as generous as some people might expect from what you've said. Um, well, for me, it's a four, a four out of five. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And I mean, namely because I just love the way I love the words that that Clement and Lafrenet put in in. Um, Ronnie Barker's mouth as Fletcher 
I just think, I mean, it just always, even though I know what's coming, it always makes me laugh. Like I say, you know, there's there's just the ridiculous things like, have you seen me headphones? Why do you want to listen to your Rice Krispies? I mean, it's just, mm. it's ridiculous, but he just, he just, with those one-liners, it always makes me laugh out loud. I mean, there's just, it's just, I just love it, you know. Mm. Um, so yeah, four out of five for me, really, which gives it a grand total of uh, seven out of ten for going straight. Um, what did I put for a, a, a normally in the, description i'll give you a you know point in the right direction oh yeah amazon it's on amazon you can actually download it and buy it uh, on amazon at one pound 89 an episode so um that doesn't include tax oh hang on amazon never pay it right okay with that social comment from this non-marxist uh you want some homework for next week please love boy it is so, talking of possible socialist leanings uh oh you're gonna love this it's called unite uh what the union we've done we've done uh, well it isn't but it might be a little nod to that who knows anyway so we've done a bit of telly this week we've done old telly let's do new radio so unite is a brand new series for bbc radio 4 and uh, we're going to go in at the ground floor series one episode one um for me the hook is mark Steele. No, I'm not sure where you stand on him. Perhaps I shouldn't even ask before we get to next week. I've, I've interviewed but, Mark Steele, actually. Oh, have you? Yeah. Oh, well, tell us next week. Okay. Tell us next week. Um, and uh, I saw him as a stand-up. I'll get into that next week. I saw him yonks ago. So he goes way back to uh, alternative comedy. <clears throat> anyway, uh, sick on BBC Radio 4, Series 1, Episode 1, and the episode title is Russian Money. That's Russian Money. Okay. All right, then. Uh, I need to go the game away, then, and set a comment, which I won't now say. <gasps> Hold your tongue till next week. Uh, uh, so I will. I, I, can I just say, actually, can, just in case we forget to mention this next week. It, it is, is this it is, you not holding your tongue? Well, no, it isn't about the programme per se, but I just thought it's an interesting point to, to kick around, and, and uh, that's why I mention it now, for, to put, it in, put the thought in your head. Um, 2021, and really the only way we can review scripted radio comedy is because the BBC make it. Hey, look, you're making my case for me. And isn't, isn't, that, isn't that a sad thing? And I wonder why that, you know, is it they can't make it work or they can't make it pay or it doesn't pay or... I just find it fascinating like, that nobody... I mean, maybe podcasting will, will change that. I th yeah, I think it will over time. And Because um, we're, well, we're, we're still in like this, aren't we? We're, we're, I'm not suggesting this is funny, but... Um, I mean, this is like a public service to, 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 in, in the same way that uh, picking litter is up at the side of the road if you've been a naughty boy. <laughs> but I mean, you, you, it's it's kind of it's interesting that that you know uh, podcasts are at a at a an unscripted stage, largely. Uh, and I do yes. wonder if it'll ever make that into like so you'll have scripted comedy. You know, we're starting to see glimmers of it, aren't we? But um, I think we are, and I think we should probably dig a bit deeper into the podcast world for our shows but uh, i've been as lax on that as anyone so there's uh, just so much um, everywhere though isn't there I mean, when i come to choose something i'm i'm like oh i want to do tv or i should do radio or i should do mm. podcast. but this is like there's bags of it everywhere isn't there it's, it's a golden it's, age it's a fantastic time to be so doing lucky this. so lucky yeah yeah anyway so maybe we can kick that around next so i'll just put that thought in your head because it's popped into mine yes that, I think, is my cue, without in, uh, being in as many words, to uh, get to anti-social media. We are at Comedy Slab on Twitter. Do follow us there. <laughs> Very briefly, you did actually like something I retweeted on Twitter. I shouldn't really take the credit other than spotting it and trying to have some kind of quality threshold. What's the guy's name? Did, did you pick up on it? Oh, no. Um, he does the voice for Alan Partridge in Spanish. And I suspect probably Italian. He speaks. You were saying seven languages. I think. I think Maybe Greek a, as well. Yeah, Yanis uh, Vasilakis. Yes, I thought he was the uh, Greek uh, minister for finance, but uh, <laughs> 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 what do I know? <laughs> Doesn't it? Yeah. The guy is just a machine, isn't he? If you, I mean, if you're not had a look, Very just talented. just Google his name. Um, I mean, if you have a bash at Giannis Vasilakis, then I'm well, sure... Well, just have a look in our timeline. I will steer people back to uh, at Comedy Slam. So, from both of us, thank you very much for your company. I, I right now, I'm heading off to... Well, is it is it Paddington? Is it Hyde Park Estate? Is it is it Tyburnia? Have I just made that Oof. up? Belgravia Borders? I don't, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm, 
<laughs> I've no idea where it is. I've got to go. If anybody's listening, you're living in Tibernia or there or thereabouts, and you know exactly where it is, maybe you're the emperor of Tibernia. Please get in touch. Yes. Um, what to say, except I'm off to Paddington Green High Security Jail to be uh, quizzed <laughs> on next week's show, which we'll put on the Comedy Slam. Till then. Till then.